So on this week's episode of Be More Super, the podcast, I'm slightly scared and excited at the same time uh, because we've got the star of Superman and Lois as well as Obi-Wan Kenobi and many, many other things. It's Rhea Kilstead. Rhea, welcome to the show, my love. Thank you, Brian. I'm thrilled to be here. Lovely and the it's reason- an honor. The reason why I'm slightly scared is is not only are you playing an awesome character in Superman and Lois, but there is a film that everyone needs to watch, which is this film, the uh, Atticus Institute. And I've got to say, it's probably one of the scariest, most disturbing films I've ever, ever seen in my whole life. It really is so well made. And anyone would think it was a true story uh, just on how well made it was i mean is it a true story i think it's one of those loosely based idea stories that then became uh you know i think it was ideas and then became its own uh its own film and story but yeah so so if anyone gets a chance to watch it watch it (laughs) because literally I, i i was thinking about it for weeks afterwards it got released in 2015 if i'm right in saying and I watched it a few years ago, um, well, a while ago. And I remember I revisited it a couple of weeks ago. And it was funny that this interview got set up and I was like, wow, okay, I'm slightly scared. But before we chat about your awesome career, this last two years have been so challenging, to say the least, pers- personally, family-wise and work-wise. I mean, how have you kept positive and how have you kept moving forwards? It has, I mean... There have been moments where I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sure how. It's been hard. I think Mm. it's been hard. I know a handful of people who smilingly tell me I've thrived. This has just been the greatest two years. And I guess I don't know if I envy that. I mean, it's been, uh, I think I embraced early on the idea that you can panic about this time or you can take it as an opportunity to get quiet and look at your life and take pieces mm-hmm. apart and figure out what you want moving forward. I mean, that first six months or so, mm-hmm. that was surreal. Mm-hmm. I mean, being in lockdown, I had I was at home with two kids. My daughter had moved uh, back in right before the pandemic because her roommate had left. And so suddenly there's a house of four of us trying to figure out how we're navigating this surreal world Mm. um with friends without friends how do you do that we're you know my my social life got i took the time to kind of let it get small and thoughtful and figure out where your energy goes and where Mm. it where you're getting back and met with you know with equal amounts what you give out does that make sense yeah i don't know i i have found it really challenging and parts of the parts of it have been amazing but Mm. it's really been complicated Mm. i mean it's it's a definite reset button on humanity on what we consider important to ourselves and also i think it's highlighted the the really thoughtful people and the people that aren't very thoughtful at all uh there isn't a middle ground and um i mean i've got two small girls and during the pandemic it was very difficult because uh, you know, I'm a very traditional man and, and you know, I, I felt like I needed to be the protector and I felt out right. of control because what could you protect them from? I mean, my wife, she works out in the community uh, as a care worker and I work um, around thousands of people. So literally it was that risk every single day. But thankfully, we're still here. Thankfully, we have realized what's really important to us. And um, I've had all my jabs. I've had COVID twice. Uh, so I'm collecting points. Um, and I'm still here. <laughs> I just I just had it for the first time. It's amazing. You say you say that, you know, you had two little you have two little girls mm. and both your wife and, and you are out in the community. It's mm. amazing to think that how this affected everybody is so vastly different mm. because my life and world got very quiet. Work went away. Mm. Uh, my ex-husband uh is also an actor and like everything just disappeared and we have two kids in their 20s so keeping them my son chose not to go to college he stayed home for that first year because of covid and keeping 
they were out in the world. Well, my son was out in the world. How do you keep a then 18, 19 year old home and down is, mm, is hard. I went through exactly the same. I've got a, well, it was, what, he's 20 now. Uh, I've got oh, a stepson so the and, and literally trying to get him to understand the dangers and let's be thoughtful. No. I mean, no, he wanted to go out. hard. <laughs> I mean, look, you are at that age, at best at that age, in a non-pandemic moment of life, you are invincible. Mm. Right? It's just mm. what comes along with the age and the bravada. And I mean, I think it's it's exactly what you're supposed to feel then. But you add this to that. My son had it three times. Did he just had COVID for the third time. Bless him. Well, well, thankfully he's obviously fine because um, you're talking you're talking about him very fondly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing is, I mean, it's still around. So you know, luckily yeah. in the U- UK, it's sort of leveled off. Um, I think the restrictions are all lifted now. Um, thankfully, um, but. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's going to be part of our lives forever, and I think the kids are going to learn about this in history classes to come because of you know how it's affected the world. Uh, but yeah. you were talking about obviously work um, and during the pan- pandemic and how how it affected that. So what I wanted to ask was why acting? Why that you know journey? Why did you choose acting and not like a a more I don't know stable. A more stable, stable. a more normal, a more, (laughs) I think about that all the time, Brian. Um, You know, the, the, the simple off the cuff answer would be that when I went to college, I wanted to take a introduction to acting in the theater department. And I also wanted to take an intro to painting class in the art department and intro to photography. And I got into the intro to acting and... The rest is history. Doors open and I just <laughs> kind of kept walking through the doors that opened. I don't, it's, um, I really truly, I mean, I'm also an artist and that's the kind of creative side when I'm not working that fulfills me, but I could have as easily walked into the photography or the art doors yeah. had those classes opened. Um, and I found, uh, you know, I had an amazing acting teacher in my first year of college who I had a major crush on. And he was a fantastic teacher. So I, I think all of the pieces, it really could have gone. I'm not one. I mean, I have a number of friends who who this is what they've always wanted to do. Mm. My daughter amongst them. But I, I'm a little more go where the water takes you where the wind blows you the doors open and i kind of kept walking through them so not a very and, exciting answer but and you certainly do and keep I do, on walking through because your imdb is incredible for everything that you've done which is great i don't i mean i don't look i think i've looked at one point a long time ago because i had a friend send me a note saying you have to change the picture on your imdb and i said i have no idea how i don't even know what picture it is um <coughs> I don't know. I th- I do think about it all the time. Sometimes I think I sh- like why didn't I do something steady, stable, normal where I knew I was working, I knew what I was doing. I don't know that I would have lasted very long, but um or what that would have been. Mm. Had it walked through my door, I would have gone that way too. And do you have a plan? Because, you know, with careers, um, you know, you start out and you want to be a manager one day and then an area manager, then a, a director. I mean, have you got a plan in place for your acting career? You know, when start, starting out, did you say, I would love to perform in this theatre or work with this playwright, this director? I think, I think when I started, I finished college and moved to New York and started a theatre company. Um with a group of people uh, and I think at that point when was that 91 ish early 90s um, I think at that point the idea of planning a career you kind of could so there was a vague idea of of what a career would look like, of who I wanted to work with, of what I wanted to do, of... I think you also used to get paid enough for work that you could turn work down. Mm. 
to try to build something, to try to, you know, I just played something like that. I would like to do, I'd like to wait and find something that feels like this now. And I, I think there was an idea in my 20s that, that there was a, you know, grand plan. I mean, I just wanted to work. Mm. I love the, I love the community of it. I love the, you know, the, I'm a process person. I like the, I don't much watch final products because it's over. You can't. Mm -hmm. So I like getting in the muck and planning something and making it happen. And then I just summarily close the door and move on. And then I think at some point, I don't know when, at some point the idea of a career shifted to, I need a job and the practicalities of, I'm just going to, okay, I like this. This is interesting. I will take this. And then, and then I stopped, I moved out to California when I was late 20s, early 30s. Uh, and then I got pregnant and had kids and took 10 years off um, to raise my kids. And I think when my kids got to a certain age and I started to lose my mind a little bit and need some, to figure out what I needed to do for myself because suddenly I realized that I had totally lost myself and my children. and absolutely fantastic wouldn't trade a minute of it but I did start to at the end kind of lose my own sense of mm. self and mm. uh, and when I went back I reached out to you know managers and agents who had kind of stood by while I took time off and uh, again doors opened and they took me back and I, I kind of uh, I didn't know what else to do. So I went back to acting thinking if I find something else, great. And, and that really just became about, let me start working. Like I'll just take work. Mm. And, and now I don't, now I really just, I'm taking work. Um, I'm open. I'm, you know, it has to catch me, but I, I don't, I don't have the power or the ability or the kind of career to to kind of pick and choose as much as uh, maybe I would like to. Um, mm. And the truth is most actors, we don't get to do it a lot. You know, you spend, you know, auditioning is not acting. It's, I mean, it is, but it's not. It's a whole different, you're by yourself or with a reader or in front, now at home on Zoom mm -hmm. all, or, you know, with a friend taping. So really the actual amount of time that we get to act, not a lot. Mm. Um, so that's the unglamorous actor is, answer is that I, <laughs> I just want to work. I just like working. I like working. I like meeting people. I like the experience. Mm. And then fast, fast forward to now, and you're currently appearing in two of the biggest franchises that – that are on our screens at the moment, which I think is absolutely <laughs> amazing, you know, to be not only in Superman and Lois, but Obi-Wan Kenobi that's been called the best Star Wars series to date, which, um, again, I feel really bad because I haven't caught up with last night's Superman and Lois and tonight's, well, today's Obi-Wan Kenobi because because of the kids. It's just getting time, and I'm like, ah, I need oh, to I'm watch sure. them. Uh, I'm so, sure. I'm sure. Mm. Well, I don't, I mean, like I said, I don't, I don't have a television and I know I can watch stuff on my computer and my phone, but I don't, it feels wrong to me. Um, I, so I, I don't watch any of it. And, uh, and I have had, I mean, this last year has been, it's been a blast. And so I do feel super lucky and I don't think I realized, I mean, like I said, I didn't, I didn't plan any of it. I, I, I mean, when I auditioned for Obi-Wan, I didn't even know, know what it was. They weren't telling anybody anything. I don't remember what they called it, but it had some secret name and the sides were uh, pseudo World War II uh, <laughs> Nazi themed um, sides. Um, and Superman Lois, you know, I, I hadn't watched it and they, they, offered it to me and I'm friends with Emmanuel Shariki. So I called Emmanuel and said, you know, talk to me. Am I going to Vancouver for six months? <laughs> and she was amazing. She was like, 
The creator is amazing. The cast is amazing. And I'm on it and I would be so thrilled. And yes, please come. It's amazing. So oh, that is awesome. I mean, yeah. how was how was the the part of Ali um, presented to you? Um, because I had Wale on the show a couple of days, <laughs> days ago and he said literally he went to the audition and his character name was like Brad Smith um, and he didn't know anything about it. I mean, how did they present the character to you? Uh, well, the pages that I read were like, uh, they were, they were, she was described as a cult leader. Uh, a cult leader. I don't remember what else they said, but that's all I knew. I knew nothing beyond, uh, you know, the parasite twins. I knew nothing about, I knew nothing. I, I just knew that she's a cult leader and, uh, and her stuff was mostly with Lois and had, and clearly from the sides, I understood that it was between Lois and her sister. But that's all, you know, you kind of make the, you know, you're given a paragraph like this big and you make <laughs> mm. the rest of it up because you have to have some answers to something in your head when you're, when you're making choices. So, so that's all I knew. And then I got on the phone with Brad and said, you know, when he offered it and said, you know, talk to me about what, like, and I think they had a, at that point they had a, plan and the beginning of the season written but i think as the season goes it changes and it gets written and rewritten and um so at that point he knew she was gonna that she was the parasite twins and that this was uh cult leader emerging with her other self and taking over the world that's kind of about about all i got which is absolutely impossible to act but sounded so fun and so um i've never been given the opportunity to, to do anything like that and and I've got to say, the way it's portrayed on screen, I think it's awesome. It really is. Um, I mean, would you do? Do you ever get hesitant? You know, obviously joining a franchise like Super Superman and Obi Wan Kenobi, so the Star Wars universe. Do you ever get hesitant on on accepting parts to be part of that sort of universe because it comes with a lot of, unfortunately, responsibility because the fan base is just enormous. Or do you, do you not get hesitant? I'm. I'm bad at that. I'm kind of a gut decision maker, to be honest. I, I, it would really do me well in my life if I took a little more time and thought sometimes and let things sit for a little longer than I do, but it's just kind of not my nature. Um, no, once I decide something, I just, no, in some ways I, I've never done that and had that. And I don't even think it crossed my mind, to be honest. Um, I mean, Obi-Wan, I, I accepted. Uh, I guess they came back when they came back with an offer, which I think was months after I taped. Um, at that point, they didn't know. They knew it was the they knew the part, but they didn't know they hadn't written all of the episodes. So it, that was a really long drawn out process. But who the hell is going to say no to being involved in a Star Wars anything once in their life? Exactly. And that is set yourself right? up now for the future. Literally, conventions well, down the line. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, I've never, I mean, And that's all foreign to me. I've never done any of that. I've never... Mm. I've never been a, I've never been in a position to, and I've never really thought about it. I mean, for me, it was, I got offered the part and I got on the phone with Deborah Chow who called and said, here's where we think we're taking her. We're still in development and we're, and she was amazing. I mean, in case doing Star Wars and Obi-Wan with Ewan McGregor and that amazing cast wasn't enough. Um, she's just smart and cool and down to earth and thoughtful and open. She's fucking fantastic. I don't know and if I'm allowed to swear. Sorry. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> okay. So, good. so I've got a picture there of you as the fourth sister, <laughs> which I think is absolutely awesome. Um, I've got another one as well, um, just here as well. I mean, what was that like? Why we're talking about Obi Wan Kenobi? What was it like, makeup wise, and and getting ready for the part? Because they they don't mess about. You know, you can see the quality and the thought that's gone into filming. It was, it, she, Deborah has put together the most incredible crew. I mean, the whole way around, but the hair, makeup, wardrobe, 
I went in for, well, the wardrobe, let's start with, let's start with my outfit, which was spectacular. And I went in for, you know, fittings after fittings after fit. I mean, you know, and they, it is all just custom measured. I went in on my first and they measured every inch of my body. I mean, you, you get a job, you get a normal job and wardrobe is the first person to call you and say, we need your measurements. We need your height and your weight. And, but it's basic measurements. We need your bust, mm. we need your waist, we need the size of your feet. We need your, you know, we need to make sure you're going to actually fit into the clothes that we buy for your fitting. This was a measuring tape around my fingers for the custom gloves, my wrists, my halfway up my, eye. it was mind blowing. And those women were astounding. So I would go in for fittings. And at the same time, uh, all of the pieces that were built, like the unbelievable head piece that I wear, which had those tentacles built into it. So the, these gorgeous, like, they felt unbelievable. They're kind of uh, soft and slightly mushy tentacles I, built into the back of the, of the head piece. Um, and the chest piece is a separate piece that's built, I think, with a 3D printer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it, was, it was amazing. So every time I went in for one, I had the other. Uh, and I think my, I have to say, I think my wardrobe is, you know, her costume is, I, I think, one of the best. And um, it doesn't stop I was, there. I was honored to work with such incredible people. And it doesn't stop there because you, you're getting your own toy figure. I don't know if I'm. I don't know if I can call it toy figure. I think I'm probably going to get lots of comments because they're not called toys. They're called figurine. Fi figurines, yeah. Figurines. Uh, yeah. Which I've got a picture of it. There it is. I, I, <laughs> I think if you look up close, I look slightly cross-eyed. Um, <laughs> I have I mean, a couple have friends you... who are. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Have you actually Sorry. received received yours yet? No, no, I have not. You would think I would get one early, but no, I have not yet. I think I may have to go to the store and buy one. Def definitely. They're the Black Series, and uh, people can pre-order it now, but they don't come out till next year, which I, w I was really? quite... Really? Yeah. So in the UK, if you pre-order it... The timing it, seems very off for that. That is exactly what I thought. I thought it's not very good marketing. You know, bring out the... T sorry, figurine. Uh, not toy. Figurine. <laughs> the toy. Um, bring out yeah, the toy. toy. You're going to get all these middle-aged men now just <laughs> typing away going, they're not toys, they're figurines, they're collectibles. Um, but yeah, so so that is uh, coming out as well uh, next year. So so uh, I've actually pre-ordered mine. Um, which you have? Well, I have pre-ordered mine. My wife doesn't know, um, but if she watches it, to I be honest, tell her. She, she doesn't watch the interviews because apparently she's sick and tired of listening to me at home. So to I was about to... to ask if she watched, if she watched. That's like at a certain point, you know, yeah. my kids watch nothing that I do. <laughs> no, that's not true. My son did watch. He came to, they did a screening of the first two Obi-Wans down in Anaheim and uh, a surprise screening. And my son Giovanni came with me. He was thrilled. Oh, that, that is awesome. Well, why but this may be the be first thrilled? thing that I've done that he's thrilled about. Oh, that's awesome. And and I've got to say as well that um, the only reason why I asked if you had your figure, because Moses Ingram had her figure delivered to her and she did an unboxing <gasps> on the in internet, oh! which, which I was shocked at. I was like, well, if she's, she's got hers, surely you've got yours. Um, and, and, and quickly, oh, while we're on yeah. that, that subject of Mo Mo Moses, obviously there's been some really bad behaviour on the internet and by so-called star wars fans and i'm just shocked i really am i mean what are your thoughts around the behavior i mean do you know about it are you aware of it i i am aware of it and i know about it i am not much of a social media uh person but i i have done some reading um I, it's fucking 2022 like what is wrong with people i just don't I the I am constantly surprised by my naivete and um, uh, and the fact that we still live in a world where people where race is an issue and people feel like they have a platform to say and do <laughs> whatever they want. It's so deeply upsetting. Although it goes right along with 
a lot of our news and a lot of our police misconduct and a lot. I mean, it, it is mm-hmm. it is. I, I wish I could say rampant and a huge problem in this country, but I, I think it's beyond. But I, I will speak for this country. It is. It's. Uh, it's really despicable. And and I think the... we had we had a president who opened doors and and made it even more acceptable to mm-hmm. for people to think that they can say whatever they want put it out there with no repercussions mm-hmm. because you're just right it's it's this it's mm-hmm. this faceless nameless like none of them have to face Moses or face anybody and see them as a human being it's very easy to sit in front of your screen and spew out mm-hmm. or shit I mean the cowards I mean you know they're hiding behind their key keyboards and I'd mm-hmm. love to be able to put a face to them so they can be held accountable it's a bit like yeah. bullying you know back in the day I I got bullied on a daily basis in person now the bullying's done over the internet I mean they're not even making an effort these days do you know what I mean <laughs> yeah no and I I think it is the same as bullying it actually takes less guts mm-hmm. Because, like you said, you're not doing face-to-face. And as soon as you look, you and I are white. Mm. It's like I have a conversation with a couple. I have a, I have an ongoing conversation with a, with a gay friend of mine who grew up a gay man in this country and in the middle of the country. And uh, where I say to him that, that you have no that, – that growing up a woman – you learn and are exposed to a whole set of things that are very similar that he doesn't think about because he holds on to his, you know, because because he sees it differently and never looked at it that until we had mm. conversations about what women have to go through. And then I'll say that we have no idea what it is to not grow up white. Uh, it's such a privilege. And then to see. I mean, I would say fucking white people. I assume most all of them are. Mm. Mm. I mean, this is why being a parent in this day and age is even more difficult now. But yeah. it's a great opportunity because I get a chance to mould my mm. l- little girls um, yeah. into great people that could be responsible for changing that in the future, which is great. Yeah. And this is why I yeah. called. This is why I called one of my girls Lois um, after Lois Lane. And then my other girl is called Kara. So, um, you know, after, after Supergirl, not that I'm a massive nerd, uh, but <laughs> um, I got away with it, which is amazing. So I just wanted to uh, nip back onto the, the part of villains because I think villains are very misunderstood in many, many shows. I really do. And villains are actually my favourite characters out of any shows because they tend to be more complex. They tend to... I don't know, be a lot more interesting. I mean, do you think that Ali Alston in Superman and Lois is misunderstood? Is there a good side? Well, I mean, look, to play her, I had to figure out what it was she's looking for and, you know, what all of this means to her and where she gets lost. Mm. Um. And then, you know, and then it get, got complicated because then there are two halves, but... I, I looked at it as much as I could as, that there are two halves to us all, really. Um, if we think of ourselves divided, good and bad, not that one can, not that it's that simple or that. Um, look at that. Laser eyes. Hilarious. Awesome picture. Awesome. <laughs> it's literally. I don't know. I, that, that should be your I IMDb. I hope I did her justice. Do you know what? That should be my IMDb page. I hope I did her justice. I mean, Adam and I spent some time talking about because he did, because he was season one's baddie. Mm. And we spent some time talking about the complications of playing a part like this, that that as soon as you superpowers get added in and you're doing things that you don't fully understand what's shooting out of you. And you have to understand what's behind it, right? Mm. What, drives you what's in your gut what what hole you're trying to fill what you know Mm. where you get lost on the path to power Mm. i mean Um, i mean the character is fantastic i love how you see the transition from from ali to the merged ali where she gets a bit power drunk I, i i i suppose she gets merged and there's no stopping her and i love the fact that on the show they really haven't got a clue on how to actually stop her. 
and it must be absolutely glorious to play a part like that on screen especially with all the special effects especially with all the stunts and 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 being able to fly uh, i mean i mean what was that process like was that was that good fun or was it just horrid i, I loved it I, I love it i am i am very physical i come from a dance background i'm an athlete i you know i, I love it and i very early at the beginning um met rob and kirk who run the stunt department and said i will do as much as you guys will let me if i can fly i like i just i also think it makes a difference if it's it gives the editors and the camera much more to work with if they can actually use you see you don't have to cut around mm -hmm. um but i love it i love the physical piece of it. I mean, it's not easy. What Toyota does all day <laughs> flying around is really hard. It's uncomfortable. The harnesses you wear are uncomfortable. The um, It's really demanding. But, uh, but I loved it. And we had, I mean, we had some hilarious moments. I mean, moments where, you know, when you set about doing this and you read on the page, for example, she, uh, uh, well, I'll just start. She, she, you know, shoots lasers out of her eyes and her hands. Well, we all imagine <laughs> some very different version. And you're reading it on paper going, all right, well, I don't know exactly what they're going to do, but let me just wing it and throw some stuff out. And I have some ideas for here. So there were days when I'm on the green screen stage, which is the entire stage is surrounded by fluorescent green fabric. Mm. So that for the effects, they can take you out and replace the green with whatever background they need to use, um, whatever special effect background. So I'm hanging on a harness floating way above. Down there is, you know, monitors, directors, producers, everybody else is down below and you're hanging above everybody hovering with cameras on cranes and and there were moments when I went, so do you want it to sound a little more like giving birth or should I go more towards <laughs> orgasm? Like, what are you looking for? Because I'm just trying to give them as much as I can mm. so that they have something to work with. But it really is, I just make a bunch of stuff up in my head, make some notes and and, and do you throw it out there hoping that, the, yeah, hoping that the director goes, no, 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 definitely not the giving birth. If we could <laughs> skew more towards... But it oh, all comes awesome. with sounds and motions, mm. and there were some hilarious moments. Um, uh, I, uh, we were, who was it that, uh, I don't remember what piece we were filming, but I'm standing on a little platform, and I was in a harness, but I had to, I got knocked sideways, so I had to kind of throw myself sideways. But the camera's here, so I really only had to kind of put my head out of frame. And in my overzealous nature, I threw myself out of frame, straight off of the platform, down on the floor. You should have heard the whole place. <gasps> oh no! Yeah, in a moment of, I was like, I'm fine, embarrassed, <laughs> but fine. <laughs> Couldn't stop laughing. Just heaved myself right off the platform. So there's there's a lot of that. You know, there's a acting in front of green screen is a is a funny thing. Well, yeah, because which because actually you connects imagine... to no, no, yeah, yeah. So, you, so, so you can't really imagine what it's going to look like. So it must be so difficult because you're using your own own imagination and the direction mm -hmm. from the di di director, right? And you really don't know. Sometimes they build some of it in. Sometimes. You know, they can show you this is what you're doing. Um, and then if you're doing green screen with other actors, you all have to stop and go, so this is what I'm looking at. That's the spot where I'm looking, and this is what I'm imagining, just so that you know that you're in the same world. And then you cut to the world of Obi-Wan and Star Wars, which we didn't use green screen once. They have these panels these led panels behind us so where the green screen would be it is a full giant room panel of 
itty bitty 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 little LED lights that are connected, that are filmed footage connected with the camera of what we're actually seeing. So as the camera moves, the background moves with it, and we're actually seeing what's going to be there. So there is no, so the actors, we don't have to make anything up. It's, there it is, the desert or the canteen, or it's mind blowing. So basically you're saying Obi-Wan Kenobi had a bigger budget. <laughs> Obi-Wan Kenobi had just a slightly bigger budget, yes. <laughs> and much, I, I, yeah. I know you haven't got a TV at home, but you know, doing all that stuff in front of the green screen, uh, have you had a chance to see what it actually looks like, the finished article in the episode? I have seen, I have seen some of it. I have, uh, I've seen some of it when I've gone in to do looping and, uh, and bits and pieces. And what did you think? Yeah. It's it's amazing. I mean, it is when when they offered me this job, I sat down and watched the pilot and a few episodes of season one before I I just thought I, I had no idea what this is and what this looks like. And I finished episode one and I thought, well, two things really made me say yes beyond my conversation with Brad. But uh, I thought this cast, the four of them have unbelievable chemistry together. Like they just, it's, and that's what makes, I think at its core, that's what makes a show. That's what, and you can't fake that. You can't, that's just, that's just casting that's magical. So the four of them, I thought had such great chemistry together. And I thought the special effects were amazing. They're beautiful. They're not over the top. They're like, I thought I was so impressed by it. Um, mm. And what's what's yeah? Been so your I knew favorite... what I was getting into. And what's been your favorite scene to shoot um, over, over over your time on the show? What's been my favorite scene to shoot? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know. In some ways, I loved kind of the flying and the green screen stuff. I mean, I had a really fun scene with Adam in the jail cell. Mm. Um, I mean, he's just such a pleasure and a joy and a terrific actor. And uh, um, I have to be honest, I loved doing this show. I had a great time. I had a great time, you know, pretty much from beginning to end. You know, you're, it takes a minute to get your feet and to feel comfortable and to understand the rules of the set and what you're doing. And But... This was one of those great jobs. I, this is a killer cast, and the crew is fantastic and lovely, and I loved going to work every day. I loved it. That is awesome to hear. And, and obviously, you know, with the previous guests that I've had from the show, it does seem like one big family behind the camera and in front of the camera, which I think is really, really nice to hear, especially when you hear horror stories yeah. about directors not being nice and, and the conditions on set not being the greatest. Um, so obviously we've we've just had one episode last night and then we've got the finale on the 28th, I think it is. I mean, without any NDAs blowing up, uh, without <laughs> anyone giving you a phone call, um, in a nutshell, what have we got in store for the finale? Um, is it going to be good? Well, Ali wins and takes over the world. Season three is called yes. Ali Alstrom. Superman and Lois. Well, I guess Lois is around, but um, I can't tell you anything. That that um, is the best plot but twist. It's... <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's what I think should have happened. Mm. I mean, the um, internet is actually exploding because we know we're going to get introduced to the next villain, and even the showrunner said we're going to get a surprise visit. Um, um, by a character from the Arrowverse and um, we better prepare ourselves because it's going to be a wild ride so I just cannot wait and I, I just think it's an awesome show and it's been renewed for season three which I think is fantastic which just shows how well received the show is and yeah. um, I, I, I hope hand on heart that we see more of you but you know like good against the bad you know it who knows who knows it would be quite nice nice to see <laughs> ali survive uh, and maybe unmerge and you know convert and uh, be a nice person um but obviously as we're talking about i know nothing about, yeah yeah no comment um so no comment 
talking about social media, I wanted to give a shout out because, you know, you've got a very talented fam family around you. So you must be doing an awesome job. Um, so if you've got any hints and tips to get the best out of your kids, please <laughs> let me know. Um, and I wanted to mention your daughter because on social media recently, you had that very proud uh, mother bear sort of, sort of, sort of mo mo moment. And uh, Ava's brought out a debut novel, which I think is awesome. I mean, can you tell me a bit about it? And and uh, absolutely, what it's like? you know, yes, uh, you know, some of us during COVID, uh, you know, learned how to bake bread, and uh, <laughs> others, like my daughter, wrote a novel, and Harper Collins picked it up and published it. And uh, um, at twenty three, she's already she's finishing her second one, um, which is amazing. Uh, awesome. And it's, I mean, I'm her mom. What do you want me to say? I love it. I actually am, uh, I'm rereading it again now that I actually have the book. I mean, I've read a pile of drafts, but I read them on my computer and laptop. And I don't read books that way. I don't read scripts that way. I like, I like paper. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But so now I actually have the book and I'm rereading it. It's, it's beautiful. Ava's, Ava's, way fucking smart she's smart and wickedly funny and um uh it's a great book it's about a woman who um who falls in love with a married man and her journey uh her journey of mostly i think self-discovery as she as she shares and unravels the story and uh pieces it's amazing mm. Mm. Yeah, well, order it, buy it, read I it. Will, I will put the link at the bottom. I know that it's available oh, on Audible, thank you, Brian. Amazon, you name it. It's available everywhere, <laughs> Kindle. Um, so, uh, But no, I am exactly like you that I'd rather have a physical book than have yeah. something digital because I know it's a bit weird, but it's like the smell of the pages and the fact that you've oh. got something physical and you can put it on the shelf and you can revisit it whenever you want and you can hand it down which is great um do you so, revisit are you do you reread things yeah i mean to be honest me myself i'm more into autobiographies either that or john grissom ah. so um i love john yeah. grissom or or, or autobiographies or, or deep in depth autobiographies yeah exactly because it's not yeah. quite nice to 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 find out about the real pe pe people i mean have you got a plan to write an autobiography in the future Oh, fuck no. <laughs> Nobody cares. I'm not a writer. No. no. Well, I am sure the majority not. of them didn't write them themselves. So they've probably got ghost, I think that's ghost probably writers. True. So you could no, always. It would be even worse if I did. It would be even more boring <laughs> if I did. No. So, so before we wrap this awesome conversation, uh, I wanted to ask if you could travel back in time to your 18 year old <sighs> self, what words of wisdom would you oh, give her? God. Oh my God. Well, when I was 18, I wouldn't have listened to anybody anyway, no matter what they said to me. So, um, oh my God, I don't know. I, I... That's such a hard question. I just want to, I mean, I look back at myself at 18, I think I had no idea how much I had going and I don't know. I think I was just like at 18, you're just wide eyed and agog in the world. And, um, off I went to college and, um, I think I would have told myself to slow down, mm. slow your roll, take it in a little, breathe, go slow. I'm not good at slow. And at 18, I really wasn't. Mm. Um, mm. I mean, I mean, thing is, we always say that, um, you know, what would you like to know back when you was younger that you know now? Because life changes. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, I think this sounds so stupid. It's so cliche, but I think I was in such a hurry to get somewhere. Like, it just felt like I had to get to this next point and then get to this next point and that... And you realize at a certain point, but I think the truth is you can't realize this without age and road mm. under your tires anyway, that it's not about getting anywhere. It's just about, it's about the day. It's about the process. It's about what you're doing right now. 
Mm. And it's quite hard shocking to know to that. Think it's hard we, to remember that now at 52. So. I mean, I've got to say, it's shocking that we only start to appreciate things when we get older. We start yeah. to see the beauty in things when we get older. But yet when we're younger, yeah. it's a pity that we don't see that when we're younger because, you know, the pos- pos- possibilities are there. And uh, yeah. But no, that, no, that's great. Um, so what's next for you? Um, are you working on anything at the moment or is it a case of you're putting your feet up, living life, I enjoying am, the uh, LA weather? I like... I like the idea of uh, putting my feet up and enjoying life. I am trying to do some of that. I am uh, in the middle of cleaning out and reorganizing my studio so I can get back to making some art and some projects in there because the back and forth and traveling is is hard on a consistent uh, work and art life here. Um, and I'm auditioning. I'm looking for that next job. I don't know what it is. Oh, there, oh. you know. But yeah, in the meantime, uh, but in the meantime, I'm you're unemployed everywhere. and uh, and uh, you know, I am. I'm trying to love and enjoy. You know, I live near the beach, so I'm trying to go to the beach and put my body in the ocean at least once a day. Um, that sounds good. Yeah, just to be able to be able to cool off and and because when I used to live abroad, that was great. You know, I lived right by the sea, and um, it was just fantastic. So you're very very lucky. You're very lucky. I am um, so lucky. And have you got any plans on uh, doing any conventions coming up? Or? Um, I am I am looking into it and thinking about it and hoping to. Yes, I. this will be a first in a new world for me. But I am. Uh, sh- yes, sure. I don't I don't have anything anything uh, in place or solidified yet, but uh, I hope so. Yeah, It'd because be we've got a lot of the uh, Superman and Lois cast coming over to the UK. Uh, in July uh, and throughout the year so it would be awesome to have you over in the UK and you can sample the weather for yourself which would be great <laughs> and then you'll go back and appreciate LA a bit more and lastly how can fans follow you on social media um, well I'm only on Instagram and and to be honest it's almost only my art and the occasional post on my daughter but it's just my name Rhea Kilstead that is awesome at Rhea, Rhea- Kilstead You've been a great guest. Uh, it's been a joy. You're not as scary as your characters, uh, which is <laughs> which which is great. And and I felt that I have I, a dark side, Brian. In case oh dear. I, I just don't let it. I just don't let her out very often. <laughs> oh dear. Atticus, okay. Well, Atticus, Superman, and Lois. She she exists. Oh dear. That is scary <laughs> thought, isn't it? But you know, no. You've been lovely, and it's been a pleasure to talk talk to you. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Brian. Thank you. 